This is the European History Lecture for Wednesday, the 27th of October, 2021. I still see people without their notepads out. Get it done. I'm going to read to you an email that I sent to you and your parents uh, earlier today. Hello. Hi. Hi. Any and all owed first quarter work in my history courses must be completed and submitted before 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, Friday, October 29th, 2021. That's this Friday. Nothing will be accepted after this hard deadline. See me during study lab if you have questions or if you need help. So, most of you are doing fine. Some of you owe work. Some of you have not yet improved your test grades, and it would be a good idea for you to do so. So, my advice is tend to this matter between now and 3 p.m. Friday. If things get done after that, forget about it. I am entering my grades and submitting them Friday before I leave. So, it is as firm a deadline as can be. This includes things like um, extra credit as well. Any questions? Okay. Secondly, uh, where we are is hopefully concluding the uh, detailed study of religions today and tomorrow so that we can uh, deal with religious wars, the age of exploration, and the scientific revolution, uh, and do unit exam one within the next week and a half or so. That is my intention. That is my hope. We'll see how it goes. So we start out with um, literature changing. Miguel de Cervantes writes the classical Spanish novel Don Quixote, which is about a deluded knight who is mocked and made fun of because he believes that it is better to live and a beautiful fantasy, a fantasy of, of human nobility, than to live in an actual world of shades of gray and mediocrity. There is a quote on my wall from a Broadway musical version of Cervantes' book, which I will read to give you an impression of some of the source material. It is the mission of each true knight, his duty, nay, his privilege, to dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong, to love pure and chaste from afar, to try when your arms are too weary to reach the unreachable star. This is my quest, to follow that star no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to fight for the right without question or pause, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if I'll only be true to this glorious quest, that my heart will lie peaceful and calm when I'm laid to my rest. And the world will be better for this, that one man, scorned and covered with scars, still strove with his last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable star. Now, like all great literature, this story can be taken in many different ways. It has great depth. And when my father's family were engaging in intellectual pretentiousness, they would always talk about <laughs> Cervantes and Don Quixote. Understand that he is as important to the Spanish written language as Shakespeare, Dante, or any of the others who helped formulate the actual written forms. Shakespeare is the great early modern European English playwright. Shakespeare's plays, summarized in a few short lines, plumb deep into the human heart deal with questions of conflicted motivation, complex human relationships, the paradoxes that we are in the circumstances that we inhabit. We are not simple 
characters in a comic book. We are much closer to the complex, tragic figures in Russian literature. But Shakespeare manages to bring out the humanity in his stories. My favorites are his tragedies, Macbeth, King Lear. I like his political play, Julius Caesar, very much, and Henry V is pretty amazing. Um, you have or will be exposed to Shakespeare repeatedly because he is fundamental, along with the King James Version of the Bible, in establishing the forms of written English but also because he, in our language, sees very, very keenly to the hearts of men and women. Uh, your English teachers would be horrified that I would cover these, or even your Spanish teacher would be horrified that I cover such figures so briefly and breezily, but it's not my focus, it's theirs. If you have any thoughts or insights on either Cervantes or Shakespeare, now's the time to raise them. Dust thou. I am tempted to ask, I know some of the great Russian literary figures, um, Dostoyevsky, Pushkin, um, I know a lot of the political writers, again, my, my senior thesis was on the Russian Civil War. I am much less familiar with Poland and with Lithuania. Would you be able to quickly recall one or two of the great storytellers, novelists, playwrights in the Lithuanian language? And if you can't, that's fine. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm genuinely curious. Well, Lithuanians don't really write plays that much. Um, Jamaite is like a woman in her, she started writing in her 50s, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, she's pretty great, but usually uh, we have more poets. Than if, if you are interested, I would love you to send me a list of Lithuanian poets so that I can educate myself, and I'll count that as an extra credit if you're interested. David, are there any, I, I assume you have some interest in Russian lit literature. Are there, any, are there any particular Russian novelists, playwrights, or poets that stand out for you? Um, I know um, Dostoevsky, I think his name was. Uh, that's like the only one I do know. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll be more familiar with Chekhov soon because we're having a play. Oh, and my one. So, what? Yes, Anton Chekhov. My, my introduction was Mr. Chekhov from Star Trek. Totally different. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no. The, the, uh, each, each. Are there other national literatures? Thank you. Are there other national literatures that any of you have particular interest in? Uh, people who um, write in English or, or in other languages that are just people you should know you should, if you get a chance to read. Yeah? Uh, I don't know if Konstantin Stanislavski was Russian, but... Yeah, he was. Yeah. And Stanislavski, I believe, is the founder of The Method, which is method uh, acting. Father, mm -hmm. father of modern-day theater. Yeah. yeah so. Because you've got to understand what's inside! And it... Yeah. All, I, all sorts of fun can be had with Stanislavski. But no, a pivotal figure, no question. Anyway, now we shift into the last phase of detail. The Roman Catholic Church does not simply take it on the chin. Protestantism does not expand forever. The Roman Catholic Church is going to have its own Reformation, which I tend to call the Counter-Reformation, but which Roman Catholics call the Catholic Reformation. One of the things is uh, St. Teresa of Avila, and her reforms of the Carmelites, both monks and nuns. <clears throat> and Teresa's understanding of Christ and Christianity was more mystical than intellectual. One of the things that happens <clears throat> with a legally trained mind like Martin Luther and a scholastic like um, uh, John Calvin is that certain types of Protestantism is extremely rationalistic, extremely intellectual. And intellectualism does not function to satisfy the religious impulse in people. People want more than simply ideas. They want something to feel. They want ways to meditate. They want ways to pray. And one of the things the Catholic Church is very good at is um, harnessing this mystical impulse. Remember, I think I've told you already 
that mysticism is a non-intellectual and intuitive, and instead an intuitive approach to religious ideas. It is not purely sanct uh, uh, sentimentalism or emotionalism, but it combines emotion and thought and insight, as opposed to rational processes, intuitive insight, uh, to help bring a person closer to God. Now, religious orders, as I was talking, vocations, uh, like becoming a priest, a monk, or a nun, is also something the Roman Catholic Church affords its people. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering what... And the specific question is... Like, were you talking about mysticism? Yep. And St. So Teresa of Avila. One of the newer orders, the Theatines, is a Catholic men's organization, a bit similar to the Opus Dei organization that exists today. What it is isn't, isn't primarily for clerics. It's not primarily for priests or monks. Uh, but it's for active Roman Catholic men to try to uh, come forward and serve the church and serve society and use their creativity to be involved in cultural struggles and so forth. So the Theatines are big on that. The Oratory of Divine Love is an interesting name. It comes from Genoa, where Columbus comes from. And uh, it is a charitable organization. Uh, and charity is, is one way that religious people or people who are interested in service uh, do play out that service. But probably the most interesting and important of the new religious orders that come as a result of the Counter-Reformation comes out of the experiences of Ignatius of Loyola. He is born Inijo. Inijo is a Basque. Now the Basques are an interesting people. They're from Navarre in northern Spain near Pamplona where the bulls are run every year. The Basques speak natively a proto-language that comes before the Indo-European migration. What that means is the Basques are one of the pockets of European uh, language that have nothing to do with the other European languages. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an Indo-European language. So this Basque culture is one of the sources of the Corrida, which is bullfight. Um, and Basques tend to be very, very deeply passionate. I'm not talking, you know, flouncy clown stuff. I'm talking the kind of passion that is operatic. Inijo is a hidalgo. A hidalgo is a soldier. And he fights on many battlefields. But as a fairly young man, he's almost killed. You can certainly chime in since you did a recent project on him if you want to add things or correct any of my misapprehensions. While, and this is similar to Paul, this is actually similar to several, uh, not only Catholic, uh, Catholic and Greek saints and important people in the Christian faith. Inijo almost dies and is laid up for the better part of a year, just in bed. He experiences fever that almost kills him. His wounds almost kill him. This is medicine of the early 1500s. Ah, uh, it's not great. In the course of fighting for his life, he undergoes a fundamental change of personality. He's still a warrior, but he, like Paul, discovers true faith. And he is going to become God's. In, in, in Iho becomes Ignatius. And he develops a series of visualizations called the Meditations, and these are collected in a book. The Meditations of St. Ignatius of Loyola are a series of ways of looking at yourself and looking at life that's unsparing. You visualize yourself. You look at the sins in your life. You look at the glories in your life. You, you try to figure out precisely what talents God has given you, precisely where you should grow to fully actualize those talents. You contemplate the Via Dolorosa, 
the road of suffering that Christ goes through from the time of his arrest to the time of his death on the cross. You contemplate the wounds of Christ. You contemplate the blood of Christ. Such visualization is systematic and it's intimate. And Ignatius is a master of this. Everyone who later joins him in what becomes known as the Jesuit order or the Society of Jesus goes through these meditations more than once, usually, throughout their life. I've done a version of them. Very quick and dirty version of one, but still. If you can concentrate on something the way the spiritual exercises encourage a person to, you can really have epiphany, which is a discovery that redefines everything in your life. Like a person who's been ground-bound their entire life. You okay, Haley? No. Do keep your head up from time to time. It makes me feel important. Okay. Um, and suddenly you are able to go in a helicopter and look at the world that you've lived in. You can see your hometown from the air. That's an epiphany. You see what is familiar, but in a new light, in a fundamentally different way. And it's growth, personal growth. So the Ignatian uh, system of uh, spiritual exercises is designed to bring a person to a series of epiphanies. Now, he's an intense man. He's a warrior for God, so he says. And he comes up with a prayer, which is honestly, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best prayers any human being has ever come up with. If you wouldn't mind swiveling your chair, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So, this is one man's idea of generosity, expressed in the form of a Christian prayer. Dear Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as you truly deserve. Teach me to give and not count the cost. To fight and not heed the wounds. To toil and not seek for shelter. To labor and ask for no reward, save that of knowing that I do your will. This prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola deals with his absolutely unflinching, uncompromising desire to be of use. And generosity, leavened by faith, is the heart of that use. To give and not count the cost. To give everything you have and not hold back. To fight and not heed the wounds. To do what's right regardless of the cost. Somebody hurts you, that's on them. Fight for what's right. To labor, uh, to toil and not seek for shelter, to labor and ask for no reward, to be willing to give for goodness sake. Now, a person who tries to do this won't succeed all the time. It's an impossibly high standard of generosity. But it gives you something to shoot for. The, uh, the, the uh, Ignatius approaches Pope Paul III, proposing a new religious order. And this religious order has the three monastic vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience within your chain of command. But there is a fourth vow that Jesuits take. The fourth vow is personal obedience to the Pope. Personal obedience to the Pope. Now, when Ignatius talks about obedience, he uses the term corpse-like obedience, as in not thinking. The Pope says jump, and you're in the air before you say how high. You obey without filter. A Jesuit is a soldier of Christ, self-described in the war that is this life. Like Martin Luther, he sees human life as being drafted into a struggle over whether good or evil will consume us. Ignatius looks at it like an army. The Pope's the general. You obey the Pope. 
period. So personal obedience to the Pope, a corpse-like obedience, an obedience without personal restraint, a completely faithful execution of life without selfishness. Now this is a call to a supreme dedication, the kind of dedication that few people are capable of mustering up or sustaining. But the Jesuits alone stop the Protestant Reformation in its tracks. Well, not alone exactly. There is something else. It's called the Council of Trent. But what the Jesuits consciously try to do is recruit the most brilliant, hard-working young men they can find. And the Jesuits approach things with a very canny sense of politics. If you are approaching a new society, like China, and now I'm going to flash to Matteo Ricci, who was a Jesuit missionary to China in the late 1500s. Matteo Ricci grows up in Italy. He masters the memory palace system of mnemonics. Using this memory palace system, he travels to Ming Dynasty China. Now, there are other Christian missionaries there before him, and they all make this mistake. They look around Chinese society and they say, hmm, what is the closest analog to a Catholic priest? Buddhist monks, of course. Orange robe, bald headed Buddhist monks. They're everywhere. They're religious. The Chinese will help understand Christianity if we come about things as Buddhist monks. And Ricci says, you're idiots. No. Buddhist monks are there for the poor, for the powerless. They're there extolling a, a religion that venerates emptiness and nothingness as a means to enlightenment. And the poor of China have a lot of nothingness. They have a lot of emptiness, including their bellies. What the elite of China represents or respects is Confucianism, the philosophy of social harmony that is Confucianism. So Ricci figures this out while he's learning Chinese, while he's translating parts of the Bible into Mandarin Chinese, Ricci reads the Confucian classics, and he takes the government exams to become a Mandarin, a Confucian scholar, a government bureaucrat, and he passes exam after exam. By becoming a government official, by mastering Confucian philosophy, as he's learning Chinese, he is able to portray Christianity as something other than a fever dream for poor people. Powerful, well-connected Chinese people begin taking Christianity seriously because of this. And in the year 1600, Jesuit Matteo Ricci becomes an official personally serving the Ming Emperor of China. He gets as high as you could go, practically, in the Confucian government bureaucracy. So the Jesuits, with their absolute commitment to develop their own abilities and to understand that you have to not only be dedicated, but you also have to be clever in the application of your missionary message does more to restore the Catholic Church in Central Europe, Southern Europe, and around the world than almost anything else, except for the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent is the Roman Catholic Church's attempt to reform itself. Do you remember when um, you have a bishop that has more than one diocese? That's pluralism. Council of Trent says no more of that. Do you remember how bishops used to be absent from their diocese? That's absenteeism. Council of Trent puts paid to that. The excesses of the indulgence selling the Catholic Church repudiates not the whole idea of indulgences, but the idea of the cheap car, used car salesman version of indulgences. 
the shyster con game version of indulgences. Indulgences become a much more solemn, serious thing, and it's, it's taken mostly away from money and placed in the context of service. The church cleans up many things that Luther and others criticized about it. The church also embraces the philosophies of Thomas Aquinas, of St. Thomas Aquinas, which is called Scholasticism or Thomism. To this day, traditional Roman Catholics cannot help but be influenced by the thinking of St. Thomas Aquinas because it is a strong, thoroughgoingly Roman Catholic Christian interpretation of reality. So between the Council of Trent and the uh, establishment of the Jesuit order, the Roman Catholic Church halts the hemorrhaging that began with Luther. And Europe is divided into several regions. Could we get the shades, please? One region is the north. Northern Europe is Protestant and Reformed. Christian. But along the edge of Northern Europe, in Central Europe, Europe becomes Catholic again. So Northern Germany is Protestant, for the most part. Southern Germany is Roman Catholic. France remains overwhelmingly Roman Catholic. There are some French Huguenots, French Protestants. We'll talk about that. So, both between the Jesuits and the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church halts and reverses what happens. Now, St. Francis Xavier goes to Japan and establishes a Jesuit mission there during their tumultuous 16th century. That's the 1500s. We'll talk more about that next unit. The Japanese conclude a series of destructive civil wars with the establishment of a new government in the year 1600 called the Tokugawa Shogunate. The Tokugawa Shogunate has seen what happens when European guns are introduced to, your, uh, to Japanese battlefields, when Christian missionaries, Dominicans, Franciscans, and Jesuits play a role in Japanese politics. And so the Tokugawa quickly determined that the Christian faith is a threat to Japanese traditional society, to Shinto, to their version of Zen Buddhism, and to the uh, system of samurais, that's Japanese knights, daimyos, thank you, uh, which are Japanese lords, and the god emperor himself and his family. Christians uh, are told to revert to traditional Japanese religions, as such Japanese Christians, and foreign missionaries are expelled. Many foreign missionaries refuse to leave, many Japanese Christians refuse to obey, and there is a mass, there are a series of mass crucifixions that happen um, as the Japanese close their society off to foreign influence. Soon, only the uh, port of Nagasaki is gonna be open to Dutch ships once a year who will come in and exchange things with the Japanese. Anyone else who tries to land in Japan is going to be sliced and diced upon by the samurai, unless they're very, very lucky. Actually, being tortured for years is not lucky. Uh, it's rough. The Japanese do not want foreign influence. Yes? What happened to Matteo guy? Oh, Matteo Ricci, he, he basically lived uh, the rest of his life as a senior official in the main court. And he set the stage for 50, uh, 40, 45 years later. Uh, the Chinese emperor at that time considered becoming a Roman Catholic Christian. And had the Chinese emperor become a Roman Catholic Christian in 1649 or 1650, the entire history of everything would be different. So Ricci's, well, and we'll talk about that. So what I'm about to show you is a uh, clip at the beginning of the movie Silence. Silence is based on the story of Jesuit missionaries sneaking into Japan, please get the lights, to minister to the Japanese Christian community, which is under deep and intense persecution. 
So um, I, I thought of a variety of ways of showing you things about Jesuits, but to me, you'll get a sense from, from this. And I'm going to pause it here for you at home because God forbid YouTube accuses me of plagiarism. So what we just saw was a little bit of what the Jesuits faced in Japan, and that's only one of the many trials that they faced. If you're interested in seeing the rest, it's a good movie, Silence, fairly recent movie. You may recognize some of the actors. <laughs> one way to learn about an idea is to learn about its effects on people. Whether or not it makes people better or worse, and whether or not you are Roman Catholic or even Christian, the Jesuits are the archetype of an organization that tends to bring out the best in people. Here's, here's proof. When Hitler and Himmler were looking to come up with a way of unlocking the potential in promising young Germans, man, they established the Schutzstaffel, the SS, who would commit the worst crimes under Nazism, who would run the Holocaust, the concentration camps, who would lead the Gestapo, the special secret political police. They were the black-shirted enemies of traditional Western civilization, of Jews, of Christians, of gypsies, of homosexuals, of communists, trade unionists, and of Nazis that weren't particularly fervent enough. They were a state within a state. And the initiations rituals that young men would go through to become a member of the SS, which also included having your genetics checked back as many generations to make sure there were no Jews that had cre crept in, um, were absolutely based on the Society of Jesus. The SS were intended to replicate the kind of devotion to Nazism that the Society of Jesus has for Roman Catholic Christianity. They did not do this. They did not succeed in this, in part because the object of their devotion was not God or a concept of God, but rather a human ideology and fallible human beings like Hitler and Himmler who led them. So let's look at three shapes to get an idea of the broad characteristics of Roman Catholic Christianity and of of the Church of England and Protestant Christianity and of reformed, and to an extent also radically reformed Christianity. It's the royal family. And here I'll be going into this in more detail tomorrow. But the Rome, broadly, broadly, Roman Catholic Church is a paramilitary structure set up like a pyramid. There's God, then there's the Pope, the Vicar of Christ. Then beneath the Pope are the Cardinals, the Bishops, the Monsignors, the Priests, the Deacons, and the Laity. And monks and nuns fit in there too around the level of priests. Everyone is in a hierarchy, a direct chain of command. Now, does the modern Catholic Church have this structure in a disciplined way? No, it does not. But in the 15 and 1600s, it definitely did. Today, the Episcopalian Church and the Church of England follow a system where there's the King of England who's in charge, and each of the bishops has his own diocese to run. There's much more independence among the bishops 
in the Church of England than there is in the Roman Catholic Church. The structure is more open to allow different bishops to do different things within their diocese, as long as broadly the King of England could certify that the entire church was, in general, in agreement on the important things. Reformed and radical Christianity has been stripped of a lot of its hierarchy entirely. There are no bishops. There's no pope. There's no king. What there are are the ministers and believers that gather from time to time in synod. Synod, S-Y-N-O-D, is a particular type of church conference. But the belief that Reformed Christians, that's Calvinists, and radically Reformed Christians, that's the Amish and the Baptists, the Anabaptists, and so forth, uh, is that God does not just work through hierarchy, he works through individual conscience. God can work through a democracy or a republic by inspiring the people of that democracy or republic to behave in a good and thoughtful way. So the belief is that when many are gathered in his name, God is present. And that if a church that is not hierarchical but structured in sort of a council way gets together genuinely prayerfully, that the Spirit of God can work through them. We'll go into more detail on that, and then we'll get into the history of the religious wars and uh, prepare for the last two things, the Age of Exploration and the Scientific Revolution. Remember, all work in by Friday, 3.30, by Friday, 3 o'clock p.m. Thank you.